Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 770. Um, today's lecture will be continuing uh, the discussion or the presentation of the history of psychological testing. It'll focus a fair bit on uh, ability or intelligence testing, at least in the form that we most currently understand it in. And for that purpose, it seemed appropriate to have another um, cartoon from the great web cartoon series XKCD. Uh, describing or depicting a problem I think many of us can relate to, that sudden seeming drop in our intelligence when we don't have access to the internet, perhaps especially to websites like Wikipedia. Anyway, like I said, today's lecture is going to be about testing. Uh, I'm calling it early testing in the United States because for the most part, I'm going to be focusing on the United States. And as I said <clears throat> in the last slide, I am going to be focusing a fair bit on uh, ability or intelligence testing. So again, early testing. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uses and abuses of testing, especially intelligence testing in the early to mid 20th century. I'm going to talk a little bit about group testing uh, during World War I and to a somewhat lesser extent during World War II. And then I'm going to talk about how uh, innovations in statistical uh, data analytic techniques, particularly factor analysis, led to increasing sophistication in our understanding of the structure of mental ability, that is intelligence, and personality, and how that increasing sophistication was reflected in the development of new tests. Okay, so let's uh, go back to early intelligence testing. And although um, I'm going to focus mostly on the United States, our story picks up uh, really in Europe and to some extent in the United States as well. And the time period we're talking about here is the 1700s into the 1800s, a period of time that we commonly refer to as the Enlightenment or kind of the early modern period. This is just a, a stretch in history where we think of or we focus on advancements in science, in education, in medicine, in philosophy, in attitudes towards illness and human rights and the rights of women and the rights of minorities, etc., etc., etc. It's a really fascinating period in history and an element of that is the way that um, attitudes towards mental disabilities, particularly um, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities like mental retardation, changed during that time period. So if we go to France, we can find a number of really fascinating figures during this time period. Uh, one of these is G.E.D. Esquirol. He was a French psychiatrist who um, is famous for a number of reasons. One of them is that he uh, was an early diagnostician. He made um, the diagnostic distinction between what we now call mental retardation and other forms of mental illness. Um, as you probably know from taking any good history of uh, history of psychology class, throughout most of um, recorded history, the treatment of people who have mental illnesses or developmental disabilities has been pretty terrible, at least in most places in the world. Um, and often, and for most of this time, people who had different sorts of mental disabilities, developmental disabilities, etc., were all kind of grouped together and either shunned or punished or uh, exiled to asylums or prisons or uh, whatever else. They were sort of thought of as more or less one undifferentiated mass of suffering. Um, now, that changed, obviously, over time, and part of that change um, uh, involved Esquirol's recognition that there are at least two broad categories of mental illness. There are the types of mental illness that are relatively early in onset and seem relatively persistent across the lifespan. And here, um, he really focused on intellectual disabilities, again, things we might now call uh, mental retardation. And there are other forms of mental illness that have relatively later and acute onsets, and which in some cases remitted. So things like we now call depression or anxiety um, would tend to occur later in life and rather suddenly and could in some cases remit or be treated successfully. So that broad distinction, which may seem somewhat trivial to us now, was a big deal back then and it was based on careful observation and patient, uh, careful work with people who had a variety of different mental illnesses and developmental disabilities. Um, so Esquirol's you know, famous for that. He's also famous or, or kind of important to us because his way of, of making these diagnostic distinctions hinged 
quite a lot on uh, the detection of verbal deficits. So uh, difficulties that people had using language to describe their own internal states or to answer questions. Um, that idea of using language as the way in to uh, measure mental abilities, again, may seem a bit trivial or obvious to us now, but it was a big deal then. It, it certainly stood in contrast to efforts around this time and, and somewhat later to measure mental abilities using various um, psychophysical tests like the brass instruments era testers which I discussed in the previous uh, lecture. A contemporary of Esquirol was O.E. Seguin. Oh, gosh, I hope I'm not mangling these French names. My mom was a high school and college French teacher and she'd probably be appalled at my pronunciation. Anyway, Seguin was a uh, French physician and educator. Um, like some of his, his contemporaries, he encouraged a more humane and compassionate treatment of people with mental illnesses, including uh, developmental disabilities like mental retardation. He developed and published treatments for uh, these conditions, including his book, Idiocy and its treatments. Side note, the word idiot didn't have then quite the pejorative meaning or, or um, tone that it does now. Um, and interestingly, and this really gets more to clinical practice, he uh, emphasized education and training of people who had these types of disabilities to help uh, decrease their suffering and improve their functioning. Uh, techniques and the kind of a broad approach that looks a lot like modern behavioral modification techniques, which are sometimes applied to people with developmental disabilities or severe and persistent mental illnesses. Now, anyone who's taken a good history of psychology class or even just a good intro psychology class knows that intelligence testing um, well, didn't exactly begin, but certainly uh, began in part with the work of Alfred Binet. Uh, Alfred Binet was a French psychologist who, um, if you've read your textbook, if you're enrolled in my class and you've read the chapter in your textbook, you know, had a kind of interesting uh, career trajectory. He had a number of setbacks and kind of challenges and uh, among his other contributions uh, to the development of testing and theories of intelligence probably should also stand as an example of how uh, sort of diligence and persistence can uh, hopefully be rewarded. They certainly were for him and, and hopefully they will be for us who are you know, at this point struggling through our classes or our early to mid career in my case. Um, anyway, uh, Binet studied with other famous um, psychologists and psychiatrists of the time, uh, particularly J.M. Charcot at the Sal Pietra uh, uh, Psychiatric Hospital, where he learned a lot about diagnosis and treatment of mental illness. Again, th this whole idea that you could make meaningful diagnostic uh, distinctions between forms of mental illness was at that point in history fairly new, at least um, as, as we understand it now, and the idea that you could treat mental illness as well, fairly new. Um, later in his career, uh, Binet got an assistantship at the Sorbonne and developed an interest in what he called individual psychology, or what we might call individual differences. Uh, the idea that you could find uh, capacities or faculties in mental functioning that all people have in some, uh, in some amount and you can measure differences, so differences in intelligence, differences in features of personality, etc. Um, and he particularly was interested in intellectual ability or intelligence and argued that it was important to develop ways of testing differences among people in uh, this, uh, this quality, this quality of mental ability or intelligence. And these efforts um, caught the attention of the French government, which at the time was looking for ways of testing school children. Schooling in its modern form, or in the form we understand it today, was really um, coming into its own in Europe during this time period. The idea of enrolling large uh, fractions of the population of children, trying to make uh, measurements as to which children were doing relatively better, which children were doing relatively worse, provide educational support for those who were doing worse. Things which nowadays, uh, again, seem rather obvious, um, were at this time new. I mean, gosh, just today I got a letter um, for our daughter, who is um, at the point I'm recording this video, is about to enter kindergarten, and it's uh, tell and the letter informed us that we have to report with our daughter uh, for kind of a early testing to see if she's ready to start kindergarten. Um, hopefully she is, I'm pretty sure she is, but that idea, that idea that you should take children and test them to see how well they're doing and how ready they are for education, 
that was starting in France during this time period, and Binet was part of that. Along with, with his colleague Theodore Simon, um, Binet developed one of the first uh, tests of intelligence, at least in the, kind of in the form that we might recognize today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it really drew upon this idea of, um, of emphasizing verbal abilities, asking people questions, and um, using their ability to answer those questions as a way of gauging differences between individuals in their relative mental abilities. Again, this may seem super obvious to us now. Like if I said, make me an intelligence test, you'd probably come up with a set of questions and you'd probably have the um, implicit or explicit assumption that people who are relatively brighter can answer more of the questions, people who are relatively less bright can answer fewer. That idea that you have now and I have now um, dates back to the work of Binet and Simon and is somewhat distinct from that um, psychophysical, uh, sort of psychonomic brass instruments tradition that I described earlier. In that tradition, there was a, a theory that um, differences in mental ability could be traced down or sort of drilled down to the point of basic uh, nervous system efficiency, you know, how fast your nerves transmit information to one another, and that that could be measured using things like um, psychophysical testing, you know, reaction times, uh, sensory discrimination, etc. Um, this approach from Binet and Simon and, and others um, was in, in many respects a much more practical approach, a much more obvious, at least in retrospect and to us now approach, and it's one that exists largely today. Um, interesting side note, and your book notes this as well, um, Binet and Simon in their original test didn't have an explicit scoring system for rating students. Uh, they were in their early development of this test much more kind of um, intuitive or subjective in uh, how they uh, encouraged testers to evaluate children. Um, it was, uh, they presented sets of questions and really encouraged testers to be flexible in their testing approach, um, both in terms of how they administered the questions and how they interpreted answers to give a sense of whether a child was relatively bright or relatively not so bright. The Binet uh, Simon scale, um, as I mentioned before, was uh, used in the French school system for screening uh, mental retardation. It was certainly popular among educators in large part because it answered a need or responded to an, uh, it, it addressed a need that existed at the time. The French school system was enrolling large numbers of students. They needed a way to distinguish between students who are doing relatively well or would be expected to do relatively well and students who would expected to do a relatively less well. It was revised a couple of different times and indeed it's been revised up through modern times quite a lot. Um, to add different, uh, add different elements, um, one concept was the idea of mental age level. Uh, this was uh, Binet and Simon's idea that there's a kind of a an intellectual age that is a, a counterpart to your chronological or calendar age. You know, children of a certain age should all know roughly a certain amount of information. You, know, you can have a set of questions which is appropriate to eight-year-olds and some eight-year-olds will be able to answer all or most of those questions. Some will be able to answer relatively few of them, but that set of questions can help you describe whether someone is at an eight-year-old level of intellectual ability. And you might have another set of questions for nine-year-olds or ten-year-olds and so on. There's a kind of an average or expected level of ability that could be um, proposed for children or indeed for adults and could be tested on. Um, it's interesting to note here, and this is a bit of a side point, but it's an important one, that Binet uh, from early on argued against equating um, mental uh, level and intelligence. He was fairly um, circumspect in his interpretation of this construct, mental age or mental age level, and didn't want uh, testers or educators uh, or other researchers to be too quick to assume that a child of a certain mental age level um, had a certain intelligence as such. Rather, they had a certain level of ability to answer questions about stuff that they ought to know about vis-a-vis -vis their schooling. Someone with different schooling or different background might not be expected to know those same things, and it wouldn't necessarily mean that that person was less intelligent in a broad or global sense.
Now, William Stern, a, a German psychologist and philosopher, uh, proposed that we could take mental age level and divide it by chronological age to yield a quotient, something which we later was termed the intellectual quotient or intelligence quotient or just IQ, um, which would reflect someone's, uh, an individual's position relative to uh, their, uh, their mental age relative to their chronological age. Someone who had uh, an IQ of over one or over a hundred if you chose to multiply by a hundred to get rid of the decimal. Um, would have a higher intellectual ability than we might expect at their chronological age. Someone with an IQ less than one or less than a hundred would have a lower ability than we might expect given their chronological age. Now I mentioned IQ just a second ago. That term was actually coined by Lewis Terman, an American psychologist and APA president, who translated the Binet uh, scale and or Binet Simon scale and revised it and gathered new norms uh, at Stanford University and developed ultimately what was, came to be called the Stanford Binet scale, which is the modern version of the Binet test, which has been revised five times since its initial development in 1916. And again, for what it's worth, he coined the term intelligence quotient or IQ. Interesting to note here that this may be um, indicative of how as the concept of testing intellectual ability or mental ability um, expanded uh, or as it um, proliferated around the world, you know, from Europe to America, the idea of what the test actually measures expanded as well. And so it wasn't too long before people, Terman and certainly other folks, were looking at uh, mental ability or intelligence as not just something that was related to schooling or how much you knew based vis-a-vis -vis what we'd expect you to know given your level of education, but rather some measure of your um, let's say relatively innate, relatively pervasive ability to gather and use information. Something more like intelligence in broad, big capital letters. Okay, some uh, important points to, to uh, mention here. I've, I've touched on these already, I think, but um, it's worth remembering Binet's approach initially was very practical and rather limited. It was designed to characterize the educational needs of children. It wasn't designed uh, to measure uh, absolute uh, mental ability, um, intelligence in a kind of a broad sense. Uh, over time, that changed though. Over time, the way that people thought about um, ability testing, intelligence testing changed. Um, it's also worth noting that his approach uh, and the, uh, the approach of people who worked with him was on psychological processes, especially language, asking questions, scoring answers, again stuff that seems probably pretty obvious to us now but at the time was rather distinct from the then uh, competing idea of measuring intelligence, which is this brass instruments, sort of a psycho, uh, sort of a psychonomic, uh, psychophysics type approach to measuring uh, mental abilities. Some interesting points here, I think, uh, when we look back on history, we can see how under the understanding that people have of a particular construct, like let's say intelligence or mental ability, changes over time. It's necessarily embedded in the, the context or the culture or the ideology of the, the time and place in which the test is developed and which it's first used. But as the test is moved elsewhere or as history rolls onwards and the context and the culture changes, our understanding of the construct can change as well. And um, I think we need to be kind of mindful of this. We have to constantly um, check in with ourselves or remind ourselves not to overinterpret or misinterpret a construct, especially in a way that reifies it and makes it seem more obvious or concrete and obscures the nuances of what the construct really is. Um, in the next section of this lecture, I'm going to talk about some of the early uses and misuses of intelligence testing. And I think you'll see a lot of examples of how the construct of intelligence came to mean something different probably than what Binet and Simon originally had in mind. And in the course of that change, there was some definite, um, some wrong done, some prejudices reinforced. And we need to be aware of that, uh, both historically and we need to be thinking about that, I think, in modern times and as we, as we move forward. <laughs>
So okay, early uses and abuses of testing. Here you can see some testing being done around the turn of the 20th century at Ellis Island for some immigrants coming into the United States. An early proponent of the expanded use of intelligence testing was Henry Goddard. He was an American psychologist and eugenicist, meaning he subscribed to the social philosophy of eugenics, which argued that there were real and measurable differences in intellectual abilities between uh, members of different cultural or ethnic or racial groups, and that these differences, uh, again, were real and they were persistent and relatively unchangeable and relatively innate, having little to do with um, environment or access to education and the like, and rather were somehow uh, rooted in us uh, and transmitted to our uh, down through uh, through the generations by heredity, um, and as a consequence of this, eugenicists argued that uh, governments should enact social policies like um, restricting restrictions on immigration uh, for peoples who are deemed less intelligent or less mentally able, um, selective uh, breeding programs to encourage people who are very uh, mentally able or intelligent to have children with each other. Uh, forced sterilization for criminals and the mentally ill and the like. Um, we'll mention a little bit more about eugenics in a couple uh, more slides, but uh, what's interesting, or among other things that's interesting about Goddard, is he actually made the first translation of the Binet Simon scale uh, quite a bit before Terman did, and he uh, simply took it in French and translated it into English and began using it to test. Uh, people at the Vineland School. The Vineland School was a treatment facility for people with developmental disabilities or mental retardation. And he used uh, results of this test to develop a classification system for levels of mental retardation. As I mentioned a, um, a couple, uh, you know, a couple minutes ago, um, Goddard was an advocate or proponent of eugenics, and he argued that using tests like the uh, Binet Simon scale, we could measure differences in intellectual ability, and then if we looked to see how those differences played out in society, we could see some definite problems that arise from people who have low uh, mental ability. Um, unfortunately, uh, this picture here is pretty uh, grainy. You probably can't quite read it, uh, but I encourage you to take a minute and do a Google search or search Wikipedia for the Kalakak family or the Kalakak study. This was a uh, genealogy that Goddard published, uh, which described the descendants uh, from two unions uh, that Martin Kalakak had, one with a, uh, a sort of a, a noble, um, a fine, upstanding, intelligent woman. Uh, you can see that's on the, the left side of the genealogy here, the normal line. This are a group of children who, as time went by, were relatively successful, uh, you know, productive members of society. Um, they were all you know, the good folks who we would all want to be or to know. Uh, Martin Kalakak also uh, had sex with another woman who was described as feeble-minded, and uh, meaning not intelligent, and you can see uh, the children that uh, came from that union were, uh, they became part of the degenerate line on the right side of the page here, and they were uh, mentally ill, criminals, burdens to society, and the like. Um, so you can see here kind of a, a, a sort of a very famous example of the, of the eugenics argument. Um, differences in intelligence exist, differences in intelligence are heritable, uh, differences in, tel in intelligence have important social consequences, and we should be very careful about who gets to breed with who, and who is allowed to bear children, and so on and so on. Because of his testing program at Vineland, and because of his publication of uh, work like his uh, study of the Kalakak family, Goddard gained a bit of a reputation as an expert on intelligence, and as a result of that, he was invited to de uh, develop a testing program for the intellectual ability of immigrants who were coming into Ellis Island at that time. Uh, based on the results of testing, mostly using his translation of the Binet Simon scale, um, he argued that there was evidence of lower intelligence among immigrants from southern and eastern Europe and from other areas of the world that were, um, at the time, you know, relatively less desirable than uh, places like in northern and, uh, and uh, western Europe, like you know, France or, or, or England or so on. Um, 
you can see here kind of the, the eugenics or the eugenics argument that's being made that there are um, differences in intellectual abilities uh, among major groups or races, you know, the idea that there's a sort of a French race, a Gallic race, an English race, and they're different than the uh, you know, Italians or the Poles or so on, or certainly different than the uh, black Africans and so on. And that these differences are important uh, or and potentially threatening because if too many immigrants of lower intellectual ability enter into uh, the United States, they will contaminate our, our stock. You know, they will weaken our people, the American people, by making us on average less intelligent. Okay, so it's pretty obvious. This just uh, provided support to kind of a, a veneer of science uh, for racist ideologies that existed at the time. There was an enormous amount of uh, racism and prejudice against all sorts of people, including people who were among the waves of new immigrants coming to the United States during this time period. And um, Goddard's testing and the testing of other eugenics uh, eugenicists kind of supported this idea <coughs> of group differences and were used to argue for restrictions on immigration. There's an important point here, and I, I've probably danced around this or even mentioned this previously, but it's that connection between science and context and the culture and ideology of the time. And as our author of our textbook says, Goddard serves as a reminder that even well-meaning persons operating within generally accepted social norms can misuse psychological tests. We need to be ever mindful that disinterested, quote, science, unquote, can be harnessed to the goal of pernicious social ideology. Uh, this is important. You know, Goddard, as far as we know, there, there's little evidence that he was a, a cruel man who set out to, to punish those he disliked. Rather, he was someone who was highly educated, he was at the forefront of an emerging field, that is psychology, and he was doing what he thought was right. And eugenics, although it seems um, kind of at, at best distasteful and at worst kind of horrific to us now, was a very popular idea. If you were an educated person in, um, in almost any field, you probably would subscribe to the ideas of eugenics. You know, this wasn't that many years after the publication <clears throat> of, our, of Darwin's uh, Origin of Species, and there was a lot of thinking about the idea of the way different sorts of traits, including traits that have to do with mental abilities, were passed down from one generation to another. So it kind of made sense to people like Goddard and his contemporaries that they should do this type of testing and they should be concerned about the results of this testing and apply those results to changing social policy. Um, not trying to excuse it, but it was understandable, I think, in retrospect. And that's important to have that level of understanding. It's also important to, to kind of engage in that level of critical thinking when we think about how we use testing nowadays. In what way are we maybe supporting um, ideologies which future generations will be skeptical of or even critical of? Now, the author of our textbook has clearly read Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure of Man, a rather famous uh, book on the uses and abuses of mental testing, especially uh, intelligence testing uh, throughout history. Um, Gould's book, you know, among some uh, you know, groups is considered controversial. I, I don't know if that's exactly fair. It's certainly very critical of psychology. Uh, Gould was an anthropologist. He, he's, um, he's deceased now, but he was he was very famous for being very skeptical of science um, in general. He's sort of a critical thinker, someone who argued for critical thinking, but also uh, very critical at times of psychology. And I, I've certainly read uh, criticism of his criticism that has, has argued that this book is, is kind of a polemic more than it is a uh, careful, considered piece of, of writing. That said, I enjoyed reading it back when I was in uh, an undergrad, and I recommend it to anyone. It, it's really... Um, provide some vivid examples of the way science can be harnessed to support um, racist ideologies. Uh, and we need to, I think, be aware of that. And, and it's a good read. It's a, it's a fairly quick read too. While I'm uh, you know, playing book club president here, I'll, I'll recommend another book. That is, Even the Rat Was White, A Historical View of Psychology by Robert Guthrie. Um, Guthrie is a psychologist. I actually heard him speak back in graduate school. <clears throat> 
He's an African-American man who has uh, done a lot of different work in his career, but has written in this book and elsewhere about the history of uh, psychology in America from the angle or with the perspective of race. And he's talked about how psychology has tended to focus um, on people who are Caucasian or white and has tended to exclude people who are uh, African-American or black as well as other minorities uh, throughout history and that has led to some really serious misconceptions about race um, like what we've talked about already in this lecture. So another really excellent book, well worth reading, I highly recommend it. Focusing on some of uh, you know the misuses of testing, um, I think is really important. I guess I'm really drilling down and emphasizing that point. But um, let's provide a counterpoint, which is some of the the positives that came out of this period of time. Uh, there are a number of interesting uses of testing. Uh, a number of interesting people to talk about. The one I want to focus on is Lita Steather Hollingsworth. She was an American psychologist, one of the first female psychologists. Um, who studied, who was very interested in testing and studied highly intelligent children, so people we might now call gifted, and debunked uh, some of the myths that surrounded uh, intelligence at that time. Yeah, there was an idea that people who were very intelligent were socially awkward or lonely or prone to depression. They had a hard time relating to people. And among other contributions, uh, Stether Hollingsworth showed that no, you know, people of high intelligence tend to do fairly well socially. Um, there are obvious exceptions to that, but generally speaking, it's not true that people who are very intelligent are kind of uh, egg-headed and awkward and, and socially disconnected. Um, perhaps more importantly, um, Stether Hollingsworth argued for specialized training for people of different intellectual abilities. Um, she was also a feminist who argued that environmental factors were uh, likely the best explanation for observed differences in gender uh, uh, between or in abilities and achievement between the two genders. So, you know, it was then a very commonly held idea um, and uh, probably not very controversial to many people that men were just smarter than women. They just had more intellectual abilities. And I'm sure uh, as is the case now, you can still find people certainly on the internet who'd make that argument. Um, there are all sorts of quasi-evolutionary theories as to why men, you know, have evolved to be more intelligent because of blah 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 and women have evolved to be more sort of I don't know, feeble-minded and nurturing, I, I don't know. Suffice it to say that Stether Hollingsworth, you know, detected those arguments in her time and argued very effectively that these were due just largely to differences in the environments in which boys and girls grow up and the massive advantages that boys have in terms of education and training and so on. Advantages that existed then and certainly exist now as well. Um, she also argued for equal opportunities in education for women, something which again, you know, at the time was, was fairly controversial and probably among some people even today, sadly, is still a controversy, but a fascinating figure and also worth, worth learning about. Moving on just a little bit in history, I, I mentioned before the Stanford Binet test. Um, it's been revised a number of different times. It's currently in its fifth edition, so as time has gone by, it's been revised. Each time it's been revised, um, the makers have developed new standardization samples to develop new norms for scoring. In my next lecture, I'm going to talk about that idea of comparing uh, test scores to norms from a standardization sample. I, I've mentioned that in previous lectures, but I'm really going to focus on it, on it in the next lecture. Uh, it's during this time period, kind of the early to middle to slightly after middle part of the 20th century, that the Stanford Binet became one of the most widely used intelligence tests around. It was developed in such a way as to make it suitable for all ages, from rather young children to very old adults, for people of almost all levels of intellectual ability, from relatively profound mental retardation to superior intelligence. Um, as I said, it became really the standard for intelligence testing, only to eventually be replaced by the Wechsler tests, um, in part because the Wechsler tests were sort of easier to administer and um, had some features which at the time the Stanford Binet test didn't have, although which it subsequently copied, and we'll talk about that in future lectures. But as we kind of round out this little section of, of, the, the, of today's lecture, I want to just focus on that little bit of history, the development and the kind of the successful expansion of intelligence testing, especially in the Stanford Binet test. Now the Stanford Binet test is an individual test of ability, meaning 
one uh, test administrator gives it to one test taker at a time and then sits down and scores up the results. Um, that's, uh, a, it stands in contrast to group testing. Group testing is where a test administrator will give a test to a large number of people. And this is something we're all familiar with, I'm sure, from standardized testing in junior high or college or, or whatever. Even my kindergarten age daughter is now going to do standardized testing. So we're familiar with that now. And although, as I mentioned in previous lectures, I'm not going to talk a lot about standardized testing in this class. It's something more in the domain of education than in the domain of clinical psychology. It's worth uh, addressing at a couple points, and this is one of them. That point being the history of group testing during World War I and also World War II. But here I'm focusing on World War I. Robert Yerkes was a, an American psychologist and a primatologist. He was an APA president. Um, he and his colleagues, including people like Goddard, uh, argued for the importance of using psychological testing for recruits during World War I. Um, to put this in context, psychology was emerging as a science, a relatively young new science during this time period. and. Um, it needed to legitimate itself. It needed to show that it could do things that were interesting and ultimately important to society. And the argument was made that, well, we can provide tests for recruits. We can find people who are especially intelligent, and then the army and the um, you know can put those people in positions of authority or control. We can find people who are relatively less intelligent. The army can put those people in positions of less responsibility and less control. And as a result, we'll have a better armed service. And uh, Yerkes con convinced the army to test pretty much all World War I recruits. Um, he was part of a committee um, the, uh, called the Committee on the Examination of Recruits that met at the Violent School and included people, like I said before, like Goddard and Terman. There's a photograph of all of them uh, looking pretty intense, kind of thinking about intelligence. Um, not to make fun of them or caricature this too much, but this is a good example of the history of psychology. It's mostly educated white men applying uh, their measurements and developing their theories. And uh, there's a critique that can be made there. It's certainly been made uh, by a number of good authors, including some of the ones I've mentioned already in this lecture. Anyway, this group <coughs> developed two tests. The first one was called Army Alpha. As a group test in a written format, it basically was was based on an existing intelligence test that had been published at the time. It was designed to measure people of average or high functioning ability, people who could read and write and could answer written format questions. Um, there were also folks who were recruited who were illiterate or who were immigrants or who were uh, not native English speakers or who were thought to have just lower intellectual ability. They were given a pictographic test called Army Beta. And you can see here some images from each test. On the left is an example of uh, the Army Alpha test. Um, on the right is uh, some are some items from Army Beta. And here you can see a rather grainy picture of uh, a testing situation. A test administrator is walking around a, uh, a room in a recruitment office. The recruits are filling out the test, as you can see. Um, certainly not the ideal situation in which to take a test. It doesn't look very comfortable. Um, I'm not sure how quiet this room is or how uh, relaxed these people feel doing their test, whether they feel stressed out or afraid. Um, but that's how a lot of the testing was done at the time. So what were the results of all this testing? A again, you know, the psychology as a science said, we're going to provide testing for large numbers of recruits. We're going to gather data on them, and then you, the armed services, can use this data to make important decisions. Well, in a way, it was a whole lot of nothing. Uh, Yerkes did publish some reports. Um, it's not at all clear that anyone in the Army used either those reports or the test data itself. Um, there certainly at the time were some doubts about the validity of the test, uh, in part because of poor testing conditions, as you could see on that previous picture. And there's also a lot of uncertainty about how to interpret the Army beta test. The Army alpha test was based on an existing intelligence test, and so there were some basic guidelines for how it should be scored and how um, you know results could be interpreted. Army beta, not so much. Um, so in a way, it was a lot of testing that did probably very little Except it really helped psychology. It made psychology kind of famous or provided psychology this platform 
to present itself to the rest of the world, or at least the rest of the scientific community. It was a great boon to psychology. A lot of people were employed testing uh, the idea of psychology as a distinct science really emerged in large part because of the use of testing, even though the results of testing were probably pretty modest, if that. It's also worth noting that the results of testing uh, large numbers of recruits in World War I tended to support racist ideologies. Again, um, I don't mean to laugh about that or smirk about that because it's really rather sad. Here's a very grainy picture that you can see from um, an old report. I forget exactly which one that I found on the internet. Um, it's sort of a, a histogram tipped on its side and you can see the relative uh, you know, relative frequency of people of supposedly superior intelligence among different groups. So commissioned officers have a lot of, relatively speaking, people of superior intelligence, non-commissioned officers less so, Negro officers less, privates less, and then you can see a long list of people from different uh, national or, or racial or ethnic backgrounds. And you can see, sadly and probably unsurprisingly, how there are uh, there were observed differences in the uh, frequency in which you see people of superior intelligence going from folks who are from England who of course are quite intelligent we all know that to Scotland and all the way down to Southern American Negro meaning people who are uh, black or African American living in the South in America among whom we find apparently the lowest levels of folks of superior intelligence um, Again, these are ideas that existed at the time, and I think it's, you can make a very strong argument that psychology provided kind of a, a veneer or a, a structure of supposed science to support ideas that people probably already had in mind. It's also worth noting that psychology became part of this broader uh, kind of social philosophy or, or ideology of eugenics. And you can see here I've tried to highlight the you know one of the roots of you or, or among the roots of eugenics are psychology mental testing and anthropometry you know, uh, testing of other uh, abilities like the brass instruments type stuff um, and you know eugenics was at the time a uh, a widely held uh, sort of belief or social philosophy especially among people who are educated and and in positions of power of course disproportionately white people um, and without trying to dwell too much on this or really make too big a deal of this, I think it's worth remembering the ways in which science, including psychology, can be misused. And I just think this is a really interesting point or an interesting idea that this testing movement, again, testing movement just refers generally to this period of time in history when psychology was emerging as a science, especially as a science that did testing. I mean, that's what psychology was for a long stretch of years. The testing movement years, the war years, especially World War I, were a period of huge expansion for uh, the science of psychology. There were all sorts of new theories and methodologies developed in that time period. That's good. I mean, I think, you know, we can say without a lot of reservation, that was pretty good. But during that time period, there were also some problems and we can see them certainly in retrospect uh, that came up with studying psychological constructs, how difficult it is to do it in a way that doesn't invite in or allow in uh, biased ideologies. Okay, so a lot of history and a lot of me uh, soapboxing, I suppose, my own ideas about, uh, about how testing can be used or misused. Hopefully that's important to you or at least interesting to you. In the next section of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about how innovations in uh, statistics and data analytic techniques, especially factor analysis, led to increasing sophistication in theories and in testing methodologies for mental abilities, that is to say intelligence, and also for personality, which I'll get to in a little bit later. So Charles Spearman, you may have heard of before if you've taken a good history of psychology class. He was an English psychometrician, meaning he was someone who studied the way that we can measure psychological constructs. 
By the end of this class, you will all be psychometricians. At least you'll have some basic psychometric theory under your belts, and so you'll be in good company. Spearman was, uh, like many people of his generation, influenced a lot by the work of Galton. He was very interested in the idea of measuring mental abilities. Um, he was also very interested in the analytic techniques that Galton developed and his colleagues developed for uh, sifting through the results of these measurements. And Spearman developed factor analysis, a, a technique that is now we think of as kind of a multivariate statistical technique that allows us to analyze groups of, in this case, test items and look at patterns of correlation with the idea of getting a sense of the deeper structure of the construct being measured by those items. One of uh, Spearman's real innovations, at least in the area of measuring mental ability or intelligence, was the, the two-factor model of intelligence. The two-factor model argued that most of the variability that we observe in performance on intelligence tests of, of a variety of sorts goes down to a general factor, or little g. Uh, some people have more of this or a higher level of this. These, are, these folks are more intelligent. They tend to do better on most tests that you give them. Some people uh, have less of this, or they tend to do worse, relatively speaking, on most types of tests of mental ability that you can give them. Little g is, is the engine of intellectual ability, or at least that's a metaphor that's often applied uh, to thinking about this model. Um, in addition to little g, there are various s or specific factors which are specific, as the name indicates, for particular tests. So on any given test, your performance has something to do or is in some way reflective of g, which of course kind of generally drives up or drives down your score on that test, and also S, the stuff that is particular to that test, whether it's a test of verbal ability or a test of visual spatial reasoning or a test of reaction time or whatever else. To try and represent this pictographically, you can imagine uh, people or a, a person or a group of people taking four different intelligence tests. And so not everyone's gonna do the same on any one of these tests or across all four of them. The differences that we observe are going to be influenced by little g, which will make some people who have a lot of little g relatively better, or they'll do relatively better on all tests, and some folks who have less little g will do relatively worse on all tests, and also a variety of s factors, so, which are particular to each of those tests. Again, you know, test one might be a test of vocabulary. Test two might be a test of mathematical reasoning or, or calculation. Test three might be a test of logic and so on. And there are things that are specific to those tests which might individually drive up your score or drive down your score on just that test. Uh, Charles, uh, I'm sorry, Charles, not Charles, L.L. Thurston was an American psychometrician who applied factor analytic techniques to a series of uh, then existing tests of mental ability and came up with a different factor solution that didn't just have uh, two factors or, you know, one little g and then some relatively small number of s factors that were specific to tests, but rather had uh, different primary abilities, six of them, that were related to mental mental functioning or mental ability. So these names, of course, are, are probably familiar to you if you have any experience with intelligence testing, either you know from your own uh, test taking or from other classes. Uh, word fluency, verbal meaning, perceptual speed, spatial visualization, reasoning, and memory. These are things which Thurston found in his factor analytic studies in which he argued were the basic building blocks of mental ability. It wasn't just little g, you know, in an undifferentiated way, you're either smart or relatively not smart. It's that each person has some level of each of these six primary mental abilities, and people who are high in all of them tend to be quite intelligent, people who are low in all of them tend to be quite unintelligent, but there's also the possibility of people being relatively high in some and relatively low in others. Now this idea was, uh, you know, this idea of using factor analysis on large numbers of test items from different tests answered by large numbers of people was, and, and in some respects really still is, the tradition within the development of theory and methodology in intelligence testing. And in future lectures, I'll talk about this a lot, the way that uh, statistical techniques have informed and, and, and uh, shaped the way we think about the construct of intelligence, what it is on some deep level.
It's also worth noting that this approach was applied not just to ability, that is to say intelligence, but also aptitude testing. Now recall from previous lectures that the distinction between ability and aptitude is a little bit fuzzy. You know, arguably ability is your um, somewhat more raw and basic well, ability to learn and use information, aptitude might be more like a specific skill you have in one area as compared to another area. Aptitude testing became uh, very popular, certainly was promoted very heavily by psychologists during World War II. World War II was a war uh, even more so than World War I that involved a lot of people and a lot of very specialized uh, skills. So if you were going to be a member of a flight crew, like a navigator or a pilot or a bombardier, you had to have very specific skills that you would be trained in. And the idea was that psychology could identify basic aptitudes, test for them, and then give prescriptions as to which type of people would do best in which types of jobs as a function of their uh, aptitudes rather than just their overall ability. Clearly, well, it would was argued someone who's relatively intelligent tends to do well in relatively any situation, but perhaps someone with a relatively specific set of aptitudes or specialized abilities might do particularly well in one job as compared to another. And factor analytic approaches were applied to tests of aptitudes yielding different solutions for primary aptitudes, and these were encoded into tests and given to large numbers of recruits. You can see here a picture of uh, Air Force recruits during World, World War II taking an aptitude test. And perhaps some of you might even remember from high school taking the ASVAB, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Uh, maybe you're, you're, uh, if there was a military recruiter in your, in your high school or a guidance counselor in your high school, you might have been encouraged to take this. I know I was. Um, and that idea, you know, started during World War II and, and continued uh, you know, to this present day. We talked briefly about modern ability tests, you know, modern tests of intelligence. David Wexler is a psychologist, or I should say was a psychologist, um, who worked with Spearman and was intra including in testing World War I recruits. So he's someone who has kind of a background and training in intelligence testing and wanted to apply intelligence testing or ability testing to new settings or situations. He worked at Bellevue Hospital in the 1930s and developed the Wexler Bellevue scale, which was a a uh, test of ability or test of intelligence that was relatively simpler than the Stanford Binet, relatively easier to administer than the Stanford Binet, and thus could be used on inpatient psychiatric settings uh, more easily. Uh, also, it had the feature of providing both a verbal and a nonverbal set of tests. Um, not that the nonverbal tests involve no words at all, but they're relatively more performance uh, driven. And thus you could work more easily with clients, some of whom had fine verbal abilities, some of whom didn't, uh, and might be uh, you know, because of mental illness or other reasons less able to respond verbally, you could still test them because you had these nonverbal tests. And indeed the, t the overall test itself would yield a full scale IQ and a verbal IQ and a nonverbal IQ. Uh, an idea which then and even now kind of has a certain sort of intuitive obviousness to us. You know, it kind of feels right, I think, to most people that there's a kind of a word smarts and a, a non-word or maybe like a math smarts that people have. That idea of a verbal and a nonverbal IQ was actually something, uh, one of several things that the Stanford Binet test later copied from the Wexler test. Another thing that the Stanford Binet test copied from the Wexler was the way it scored intelligence itself. Originally, the Stanford Binet test had what's called a ratio model of intelligence. We've mentioned this before. It's simply your intelligence quotient, your mental age divided by your chronological age, multiplied by 100 to get rid of the decimal. If you have a high IQ, meaning above 100, then your mental age is relatively bigger than your chronological age. If you have a low IQ, your uh, IQ is less than 100, 
the opposite. Your mental age is relatively lower than your chronological age. Now this makes a certain sort of intuitive sense and it kind of works fairly well with children, but the obvious problem is once you get to be an adult, as I can certainly acknowledge, your chronological age keeps on going up and your mental age at least feels like it doesn't. <laughs> so using a strict ratio model of intelligence, once you hit your adult years and you're out of school, your IQ drops and uh, believe me, some days it really feels like that. The Wexler assist, uh, tests developed a different approach. It was called the deviation model of intelligence. And that assumed that at any given age range, there should be a normally distributed, uh, uh, there should be a normal distribution of ability. So if you look at the people who are aged nine or aged 19 or aged 29 or aged 39, within any age range, there should be some people who are relatively uh, smart and some people were relatively not so smart and a lot of people in the middle and you could develop a test by picking sets of items that are going to be uh, yield responses that conform to that pattern for any age range so among people who are again you know 39 years old there ought to be a set of questions you can ask such that for the most part a few people get them all right a few people get them all wrong and most people get some median amount of them correct and incorrect um, you can transform scores, raw scores for these types of tests such that they have a mean value of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. I'll talk about this actually in my next lecture. And if you do this, you can for any given age range, knowing someone's score and knowing someone's age, say where they are relative to other people at that age range. Are they about 100, meaning they're about average for their age? Or are they a little bit above or a little bit below and so on? Um, it sort of expands or makes more flexible that same basic idea that you're sort of thinking about where someone stands relative to other people within their same age range. Important points here, I kind of mentioned this already, but just simply the idea that increasing sophistication in methodology, different ways of testing, different ways of asking questions, uh, and increasing sophistication of data analytic methodology, especially multivariate stats like factor analysis, led to greater understanding of the structure of this important construct, mental ability or intelligence. It helped us to understand more what intelligence quote unquote is in some deep sense. Is it, is it just one thing, little g, or is it a set of things like primary mental abilities? Is there a, a verbal nature or facet of IQ and a nonverbal facet IQ or something else? And it's not like this has exactly been settled. As we'll see in future lectures, uh, the debate and the kind of the research in intelligence continues uh, well to this day and will likely continue far into the future but it's now much, much, much more sophisticated than it was ever before, in large part because of these types of methodological advances. And we'll see kind of a similar story when we look at the structure of personality. This is a short little section at the tail end of my lecture, um, but I want to address it because it's part of the history and I think it deserves a bit of attention as well. Before we get to that, let's just remind ourselves what personality is. I mean, I've been talking so much about ability or intelligence. Let's transition and talk about personality. Personality uh, can be defined in different ways, but probably a simple way would be to say it's a pattern in how you think, how you feel, how, and how you behave. It's pervasive and persistent, meaning it tends to be the way you think, feel, and behave in most areas of your life for most of your life. We think of personality as a relatively stable and sort of broadly distributed thing. If I'm a, a rather outgoing person, then generally speaking, I'm outgoing in most situations, probably not all, but most situations, and probably I am that way most of the time throughout most of my life. If that's true, then someone might say, well, his personality is very outgoing. Um, we also, of course, imagine that there are individual differences in this, that people vary in terms of these features, these kind of persistent, pervasive tendencies or features. Some people are relatively more out outgoing, some people relatively less outgoing, and so on. Traits are a way that we often think about personality. We organize these, these facets or features under descriptors like extroversion, neuroticism, openness to experience, and so on. And we measure individual differences on these traits by asking people sets of questions that they respond to that are in some way related to 
whether they have a relatively high level of a particular trait or a relatively low level of a particular trait. Now this tradition of what we'll see in the future lectures is called objective personality testing as compared to projective uh, personality testing. Um, dates back probably a long ways. In previous lectures I've talked about uh, the Greco-Roman physician uh, Galen developing a, a way of assessing his different, uh, his different um, uh, features of personality that were based on his theory of the bodily humors. But in more modern times we can go back as far as Robert Woodsworth, who is an American psychologist in the early part of the 20th century, developed the personal data sheet, which was just really a simple questionnaire of neurotic symptoms. Symptoms that came from checklists or interview schedules or just expert opinion on neuroses, things like anxiety, depression, obsessiveness, and the like. Um, you could administer this questionnaire to uh, a person and then you could score up the number of endorsements they made for those items. Someone who endorsed a lot of the items saying that they were true about them most of the time or in most situations would be considered more neurotic than someone who endorsed relatively few of those items. Another American psychologist, Robert Bernreiter, uh, took this approach and expanded upon it, developing the Bernreiter Personality Inventory, which was a multi-scale personality inventory. It had uh, multiple uh, traits or uh, scales that it measured, introversion, dominance, neuroticism, and self-sufficiency. Um, I may include some additional readings on this, but a lot of the, uh, the push for personality testing came out of the uh, attempts of psychologists to present themselves to industry. During the 20th century, of course, industry was flourishing and, you know, we're sort of in the post-industrial uh, revolution period. Uh, the, there were a lot of large businesses that wanted to screen applicants for jobs and psychologists said that they could present or that they could develop tests which would identify different personalities that would be more or less acceptable for different types of jobs. So. Again, long story short, as, as important as the war effort was for the development of ability testing, intelligence testing, there's kind of a parallel history when the, the development of large corporate American jobs inspired or encouraged the development of personality testing. And the Burn Writer Personality Inventory is just an example of that. Raymond Cattell, the American psychologist, uh, argued that psychology needed a quantitative taxonomy of personality that was all fine and well to come up with different scales that apparently tested different facets or features or traits of personality, but what we really needed was something with a little bit more uh, mathematical and kind of statistical rigor. So of course what he did was he applied factor analysis to personality items that he got from different personality tests or that he made up himself and found a factor solution that included 16 factors that accounted for most of the variance that he saw in the ways that people answered questions. And he encoded these factors in the 16 PF, Personality Factor Questionnaire, an instrument which has been revised many times from about 1956 up to 1993 at least the last time I checked. Here is a printout from a modern uh, 16PF. It's, it's a fictitious um, file that I got from the publisher. But you can see here on the left column going down the 16 personality factors, each of which is represented by a kind of a dipole. So the first factor is called warmth uh, and someone on the warmth trait or dimension can range between a very high score, meaning they're a very warm person interpersonally, to a very low score, meaning they're a very reserved, a kind of, you know, sort of emotionally and uh, socially aloof person. Um, next factor, reasoning. Someone can range from being relatively high on that factor, being a relatively abstract thinker, to very low on that factor, being a relatively concrete thinker. Now this idea of developing multi-factor personality inventories and, and kind of um, evaluating them with factor analytic techniques um, was and, and is a huge uh, and continuing advancement in personality testing. Uh, to just pick another very famous example of that, um, Starkey Hathaway and J.C. McKinley developed the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory back in 1942. This was an inventory that included personality items 
items for abnormal psychology, so psychopathology, uh, like depression, schizophrenia, etc. It also, interestingly, included items kind of hidden in the test that measured potential invalid responding. The tendency uh, for a particular test taker to respond in a way, for instance, that exaggerated how ill he appeared, or minimized how ill he appeared, or to answer in a way that was kind of haphazard or random, whether out of carelessness or out of confusion. These uh, kind of checks that uh, the MMPI had made it very valuable because it helped uh, assuage people's concerns that these tests were too easy to fake. Uh, the MMPI was, well, relatively harder to fake because it had some safeguards built into it. And subsequent revisions of it have included these. And indeed, many other tests, especially tests of personality and psychopathology, have also included different types of invalidity items, some of which were pioneered with the MMPI. You know, by the end of the 20th century, there's a total proliferation of multi-dimensional or multi-factor uh, questionnaires for normal personality, things like the NEOPI, for abnormal personality and clinical features, CPI, uh, California Personality Inventory, MCMI3, the Milan uh, Clinical Milan Clinical Multi-Factor Inventory, I think is the full name of that, uh, and so on. The, the current MMPI is the MMPI-2RF, which I'll have lectures on in the future. Important points, uh, as in ability or intelligence testing, increased, increasing sophistication of methodology led to increasing understanding or better understanding of the structure of personality. Uh, and advancements in how we could test personality. Okay, so thank you for sticking with me. This has been a, an hour long lecture or so, at least according to my clock here on my computer. Thanks for keeping up with it. I hope it's been interesting. It's kind of rounded out our history of testing. In future lectures, I'll talk more about history when I focus on, for instance, personality tests or focus on ability tests. But I think it's good to have a, a general sense of history. Hopefully you found it interesting to, to uh, follow along with. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about interpreting test results in a kind of a general sense. That's answering the question, raw test data. What does it mean? How do we interpret uh, raw test data? I'm going to highlight some essential statistical concepts, stuff that's probably kind of a review for most of you, uh, but is worth, well, reviewing, as are many things in your education. And I'll also talk about some ways that we work with test data by transforming it to make it more readable or more easily interpretable or more e easily communicated to other professionals and to clients and to students and the like. So as I always say at the end of these lectures, thanks for your attention. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have a little time, sit down, make yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, drink slowly, allow all this information to set in. If you have questions uh, and you're in my class, contact me directly by email or just find me in the building or in the classroom. If you uh, want, post questions on Blackboard. If you're just looking at these videos on YouTube, good for you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's nice to know I have fans. Um, if I indeed I do. Uh, but yeah, if you're just watching this on YouTube, put a comment in the comment section. I try to keep up with my YouTube channel and answer questions when I see them. I'll do my best to respond. So uh, again, thanks for your attention and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.